through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 238. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of the release of The Incredible Burt Wonderstone, yes. I should do. Not just Burt Wonderstone, The Incredible yeah. Burt Wonderstone. Yeah. It's very incredible. <laughs> We're going to be talking about Steve Buscemi, mm -hmm. who is one of the most prolific supporting actors Seriously. of the last three decades, I would say. I think, I think he is like the. He is one of those people that's like the Quentin Tarantino Coen brother go to, mm -hmm. and like oh, yeah, totally. made a career based on being supporting actors in those two guys, those two different filmmakers, like movies yeah. <laughs> enough to like make his own career out of it. And he's finally really getting more uh, lead mm -hmm. opportunities that we'll get to when we talk about him. But I mean, he's really defined his career as being one of those supporting mm -hmm. guys. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, nevertheless, one of the first places we're going to start is one of those guys you just mentioned, Quentin yes. Tarantino and Reservoir Dogs. Yes, this Mr. Is, Pink. Yes, Quentin Tarantino's directorial debut. Mm -hmm. uh, the story of a group of um, gangsters, I don't know what you want to call them. Thieves. Who, thieves. Who criminals. Get to, Let's get say fun-loving criminals. <laughs> I like that. I actually like the fun-loving criminals, I know. so that's not going to insult use, me. And they use lines from... Uh, this movie. Or, yeah. yeah. Uh, a group of fun loving criminals who get together <laughs> to, was it Rob a Bank, I believe? Yeah. Or Jewelry Store? I forget. Something goes terribly awry. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Mr. Orange. Jewelry Heist, you're right. Jewelry yeah. Heist. Mr. Orange gets shot. And, uh, and you know, other things. everyone starts turning on each other mm -hmm. and it ends up. Uh, this movie was made uh, incredibly cheap. I think it started out with uh, like a $30,000 budget and pretty much all non actors. Uh, nobody big, and then Harvey Keitel was told about it by a friend of a friend of a friend, and he called Quentin Tarantino, said, "I will help you produce and star, and raise the budget from thirty thousand to one point five million." Which, if you imagine, when you only are thinking of starting with thirty grand, one point five million is pretty it's pretty impressive. awesome, yeah. And almost everything in this movie is like low budget, like the car that. Michael Madsen drives is his car. Most of the people's suits they're wearing are their own suits because they didn't have anything. Like, um, what is it? Nice Guy Eddie, I think. The, the track suit yes. that, that one dude's wearing is his actual track suit. Like, <laughs> it's clothes they had. I mean, it definitely really de define that Quinn Tarantino style of like quippy dialogue mm -hmm. especially the opening scene where they're all sitting around yes. talking about like Madonna <laughs> yes. pop culture and stuff like that Madonna wrote also by the way sent Quinn Tarantino a letter with that album saying it's about love not fucking <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I necessarily even believe her too, though. Uh, he's pretty. He's pretty persuasive in his yeah, argument. He really is. But I mean, he's also persuasive in his argument about why Top Gun is gay. Spencer, I'm not going to disagree <laughs> with that, but I still enjoy it. Oh, hey oh, hey oh. Um, but yeah, this really set the bar for Quentin Tarantino. It really was a good set the bar for Steve Buscemi's the. It's a great ensemble. Role. I mean, you think yeah, uh, Harvey Keitel, mm -hmm. Tim Roth, Michael Madsen, who played uh, Vic Vega. Yep. Obviously, the the brother of. Um, the Quentin Tarantino, I mean, um, John, John Travolta, Travolta from Pulp, Pulp Fiction. Fiction. Yeah, uh, they always talk about doing a Vega Brothers movie. But now we'll they're too old. Oh, well, never seen. According to IMDb, it's been canceled because the actors are now too old. Well, it'd be hard to do John Travolta because he a is much older than he was back then, and b his character's dead. <laughs> but uh, it, would, it was a prequel. It was right. supposed to be. A well, book. the point is, he's too old to play a younger yes, version. Yes, that's, that's what I'm saying. It was going to be double v double v Vega. No, you might be able. To, Michael Madsen might be able to work it. No. Like, he looks the same. I think it's interesting that you know you. Quentin Tarantino often gets this uh, stigma, or, or I don't know what you want to call it, of being like overly violent and bloody. And yes, he's definitely gone that way with mm. his career. But I think it's interesting that this, his directorial debut, so early in his career, you know, it's a very violent and bloody movie. Sure. However, during the filming, a paramedic was kept on scene at all times to make sure that Tim Roth's character, Mr. Orange, the amount of blood that he was losing was kept consistent and realistic to what an actual gunshot would be so even though that seems so gratuitous and over the top and like just soaked and like he was they had to peel him off of it because it would dry so much that's actually pretty scientifically accurate and i would also say i mean he's known for hyper violence mm -hmm. and it's obviously something that's increased as he's gone on but in this one uh, one of the most fav famous scenes, the scenes with the ear, mm -hmm. like they actually cut away from, so yep. you don't actually see it. I mean, obviously, that's probably budgetary. Driven. Well, they originally had one where he was going to cut it, and there was going to be a tube of, of blood that was going to squirt out. And after actually looking at it, Michael Madsen was like, "You, that makes it tame." After all that buildup, just to have that spurt, he felt it made it tame, so he convinced Quentin Tarantino to actually yeah, cut no, out. It worked. It worked so much better. And I mean, 
it's, it should be no surprise that, you know, it was, let's see, it was nominated for a whole bunch of Indie Spirit Awards. It was nominated, or Steve Buscemi won for Best Supporting Male. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Best First Feature it was nominated for, Lost. Uh, Indie Spirit Award nominee for Best Director, which it lost, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. and it was also a Sundance uh, Grand Jury Prize nominee, mm -hmm. which it lost. It's also interesting to see that this is, you know, I mean, because obviously it's his first directorial film, so it's not surprising that it would start here, but this is when uh, Sally Menke first joined mm. the, as editor with Quentin Tarantino, and she was originally, her agent lobbied for her not to take the film. And then she just dis fire that agent. Yeah, she disagreed and went on to do his first six movies, and like was really prolifically popular and as an editor, so. And there's so, the whole Hi Sally and Glorious Bastards uh, cut. I, I, I mean, I think... If he, she didn't fire that uh, <laughs> yeah, seriously. agent, like, yeah. clearly, so, like, I would be like, uh-huh, uh, oh, yeah, what should I also... Steven Spielberg wants me to do a film. Should yeah. I not do that too? <laughs> I also like the fact that, you know, I always wondered where they got the title for this film, because it's never said in the film. Mm. But it actually comes from uh, a patron of the now-famous video archives that Quentin Tarantino mm. worked at. When he worked there, he would often recommend little-known titles to people when they came in. And somebody came in, and he re he recommended Au revoir les enfants. The mm -hmm. I think Truffaut yeah. film, and the the patron mockingly replied, "I don't want to see no Reservoir Dogs." Awesome. And I think he probably just thought that was such a great way to turn that title into that. And he probably know, stuck in his head. Worst case scenario, if someone mixes up Au Revoir Les Enfants with Reservoir <laughs> yeah. Dogs in the future, he gets a little extra viewing. You know? <laughs> exactly. It's like you know trying to do the same name but drop like a letter like <laughs> yeah. Yahoo with three uh -huh. O's, something the, like that. Bruce Lee with two with one E. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You see your threes. <laughs> yeah. You know, either way. Lee. Cover, covering your bases. Bruce yeah. Lie, L I. It's funny though because you know Steve Buscemi really gets frequently sort of categorized as a dramatic actor, mm -hmm. which, I mean, he does a lot of yeah. it, he does it very well. But he actually does and... a lot of comedy. Yes. And the next one we're talking about, Airheads. Oh, man. Was Fuck yeah, Airheads. friggin' hilarious comedy yeah. that I would say is underrated. Oh, totally. I mean, this is like, you're in the pinnacle of popular Brandon Fraser before he did shit like Monkey Bone. Mm -hmm. Your your pinnacle of, pinnacle Adam Sandler. Rise you're, of Adam Sandler. Yeah, yeah, you're right in the like happy happy Madison era when it was actually bumping. I mean, and Steve Buscemi playing an awesome a, a comedic role and it's a friggin' 90s movie 94. about alternative alternate Yeah, it was music. perfect time. I mean, this is right when Nirvana was blowing mm -hmm. up with was it smells like or I guess he died in 94. Oh yeah, you're, So you're I mean, right. this is like during the peak Yeah, but you have movies like Nirvana. this and Empire Records are like those perfect quintessential 90s movies about the music of the 90s. And it's great, you know, if you haven't seen it, it's about the three rockers who basically uh, take a rock station hostage to play their demo because they don't get any airtime. Yeah, they, nobody gives them respect because yeah. they don't have any sort of... Um, Cred. Cred, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so they take over a station, it's discovered the station's turning into soft rock. Yes. <laughs> and then it sort of becomes this rock rebellion mm -hmm. to try and keep it going. Yep. It's, I mean, it's... Great Chris Farley roles. It's, roles it's just funny. I mean, there's so, Joe Montana. Yeah, oh, he's funny. great. I mean, there's just a whole bunch Michael of... Michael Richards is in this Michael movie. Michael Richards, yep. Ernie Hudson. Yeah. Oh, well, there's just a whole... The Huds. <laughs> Jud, Judd Nelson was the asshole yes. record executive that blows yep. them off until they become criminals. Uh -huh. And it's funny because it's like, oh, no, no, it's your criminals. We finally have something we can sell. So yep. the irony of very, the whole situation. Very honest and realistic. But, like, it's just like, it's so over the top that mm -hmm. it's, it's funny like they don't even try and make it feel like a real sort of uh situation it's just it's played for a I mean, they're using ball. water pistols to take advantage and it's it's great you know i think it's interesting one of those things that goes with like a movie that was really like linked into the music that made it is that uh rex gives uh ian the this record record um rex I mean, the, played by steve buscemi yeah rex gives Ian, who I believe is the radio, uh, Joe Montaigne's character, yeah. uh, CD and asks him to play track two at one point. Uh, and that track two was I'm the One by Four Non Blondes, which on the Airhead soundtrack, track two is I'm the One by Four Non Blondes. It's an odd. And, and for the record, the song that they've been, they try and get him to play in the movie by the Lone Rangers yes. is a friggin' awesome song. Yes. And actually, I, like, that's something that really is important to me <laughs> is that in musical oriented movies, mm -hmm. the music actually be good. Yes. So if you're like a story about a exactly. band with a shitty song, like, again, you know, like that thing you do. Yeah. Like that was a fairly catchy song, so yes. that worked out exactly. all right. But you can't, you can't have yeah. bad music in yeah, a movie about a band true. like it just 
it, it really grinds my gears to steal a, <laughs> a phrase from Peter Griffin. Yes. Um, if if it's like bad music, I'm like, who cares? Like, yeah. I don't care. Like, like that's your penultimate. Like yeah. the movie built up to this. Yeah. Like, and so when they finally get to that point where they are rocking, and it at does, the end, yeah, it rocks. It's awesome. Yeah. It was a lot great, of fun. great fun movie. You should definitely check it out, especially if you're any fan of Brendan Fraser or you just enjoy Steve Buscemi in comedic roles because he oftentimes gets to play like the kind of manic, angry characters, but in this case, it's manic and angry for the sense of being funny, and he does it so. Well, like so much better than I think you'd expect it, unless you've seen him in a lot of, of Coen Brothers. And films. it's also a restrained Adam Sandler. Mm -hmm. Like he's yeah. not so over the top like he is. Yeah, in a he's lot a goofy of... character, but he's not like center stage goofy. He's supporting actor goofy. Yeah, it's it's, a, it's just a good ensemble. Yeah, it is. And again, it's crazy to think you know, just a few years later, mm -hmm. Steve Buscemi moves right back into dramatic with Fargo. Yes, this might be perhaps his most memorable role. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You, I mean, you could argue this either way. Yeah, story of uh, a, a couple. Um, criminals who mm -hmm. uh, kidnap the wife of a car dealer. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it was the daughter of the owner and the husband or, or wife of the of William H. Macy's character who also works at the same dealership. Right. And it's attempt, like a fake hostage to the attempt to extort or... Because he's desperate for money. Yeah, he needs money so he was trying to extort basically his own father-in-law out of the hostage money. Yes. And things go awry as they yes. always do in Coen Brothers films. Uh, I would say particularly bad for Steve Buscemi <laughs> as he yeah. ends up in One the wood the, chipper. That wood chipper is on uh, display in the Fargo in the Fargo Museum in actual Fargo, uh, I mean, Minnesota. A film made famous for its it's uh, allusions to being a true story. Yes. And while it is inspired by true stories, it itself is not actually a true story. You know what's crazy? I, I didn't remember this till I read it. They This was turned into a TV show and had two, uh, based on the um, character Frances McDormand plays and her husband. Mm. They actually had a Marge Gunderson. ABC pilot. And when I saw the actress who played Marge, I was like, oh, I actually remember that. That's, mm. that's sad. That's too bad. And, and I mean, Francis McDormand, Mar Francis McDormand's Marge Gunderson, mm -hmm. is probably one of the best sort of female characters mm -hmm. in like the as last far twenty as, years. Oh I mean, yeah, she's so she's very um, smart. Mm -hmm. She's very savvy. She's very tough. In like, the same way that like Ripley is like that great embodiment of all the strongest things in in female character or persona, uh, I think Marge Gunderson is the embodiment of the average woman who still contains all of those strong features because re she's pregnant, you know, I was, Minnesota I was cop. Similar, like, similar sort of vein, say like, you know, she is deceptive and you think like, mm -hmm. yeah, she's like Midwestern. She seems very simple. Her yeah. accent makes her seem dumb. Mm -hmm. She's pregnant so you don't think she's really that yeah, tough. But she's actually but she's, very She's sharp. playing you a lot of the time. Like, she's like, oh, don't you know? Yeah, oh, like, yeah. Thinking you underestimate <laughs> her, but she's totally like seeing through mm -hmm. the bullshit and she's just, just amazing, amazing. Role of Carl Showalter, written specifically for Steve Buscemi. So clearly, the Coen brothers knew the talent of Steve Buscemi even at that time to say, "We want you to be this character." We it's wrote kind of it for a shame you. that he wasn't nominated for the film. I mean, Francis Snormit won for best best actress. Mm -hmm. uh, Coen brothers won for screenplay. Mm -hmm. Got nominated for best picture. William H Macy got nominated for best supporting actor, which is I could, fine. He, yeah, I can He's see good. that. He's really. But it's sort of a shame that you know Steve Buscemi didn't get any yeah. love either. So uh, I also just find it interesting because it's one of those you know location type films. The name of the film is a place, uh, but none of the movie scenes, either exterior or interior, were actually filmed in Fargo. The bar exterior shown at the beginning of the movie uh, are located in Northeast Minneapolis. Okay. Otherwise, everything else soundstage. Yeah, very good. Yeah, it's no surprise that as about this time period was hitting, Steve Buscemi was reaching probably uh, the mainstream audience. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are not recognize yeah. him, and because of that, he was able to go on and write and direct his own work. And yes, he did Trees Lion. Yes, and Starin. And Starin. Yes, mm -hmm. Triple Threat. Yes, Triple threat. boom. Which uh, the story was it? An un unemployed mechanic who spends most of his time in his bar, in a bar, mm -hmm. Trees Lounge, a small blue collar town. He seems to always be thinking, if only X, then I could stop drinking. Yes, yes, it's very much a sad alcoholic movie. It's, yes, uh, which weirdly enough has Carol Kane playing a bartender in it, and um, what's his name, Mark Boone Jr., Bobby yeah. Elvis from uh, Sons of Anarchy, in a, in a very young role. But uh, this, yeah, it's an interesting film. It's a very depressing film. Uh, it's very, I think, semi-biographical because Trees Lounge is an actual bar. Mm. I think, like, Steve Buscemi bought the sign for it to use in the film. And we should also know that Steve Buscemi 
is or was a firefighter at one point. Really? Yeah. You so know what like, he also was? He was an actual ice cream dri truck driver on the streets that they filmed him being an ice cream truck driver in the movie. Because that's part of what the role is he takes on a job as an ice cream driver and gets ends up in an illicit affair with um, Chloe Sevigny, who yes. was playing like a... Very young. Very young. But I love you, Steve Buscemi. Don't get me wrong. But if you were an ice cream driver in a town that I lived as a kid, I would never buy ice cream from you. That would be yeah. the creepiest goddamn yeah. ice cream driver I could creepy. ever imagine. But also this movie, you know, this is one of those things that goes to show. It's like written, directed, starred, small idea, small indie film. Mate, shot in 24 days. Just sort of like, boom, in and out. Less than like, a month. like uh, Stanley Tucci and... Uh, yeah. Um, um, uh, not Winter's Bone. Uh, what's the name of the movie with... What's her name in it? Uh, from Hannah. And yeah. Anyway, you know, he... Yeah. It's... Um, Keep going. Uh, it, okay. Anyway, it's it's. I mean, it's it's sort of one of those characters that, like, even though you know you're playing this role, uh, the mm -hmm. Lovely Bones, where Stanley you, Tucci Bones. plays yes. like the child. <laughs> yes. Murderer, like, yeah. If I live next glasses, yeah. mustache. If I live next door to him, I'd be like, okay, that yeah. guy is clearly gonna murder a child. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's sort of like one of those things that, yeah, it just it seems implausible that people are actually willing to buy ice cream <laughs> yeah, from this guy because yeah. he's so creepy. Yeah. But it's an interesting movie. It's pretty sad. Uh, but terribly it's, sad. It's yeah. it's on Netflix Instant if you want to check it out. Lower. Mm -hmm smaller budget I, I mean I think it's one of those examples also that like not necessarily everyone can easily make that transition between acting and directing mm -hmm. like there's some people who are better equipped like I mean you could argue Ben Affleck or not I mean it took him a little bit mm -hmm. of time to adjust I mean Clint Eastwood any number yeah. of people have done it successfully I mean like Kevin Spacey had mixed yeah. results with Albino Alligator which I enjoy but yeah. it's obviously not any sort of classic, and, and this it doesn't of, pounce, at, but like jump at the fact that Kevin Spacey made it. You're not like remembering that yeah. more than anything else about it. And I mean, I mean, Trees Lounge is a perfectly fine film, but it's it's one of those ones that like I wouldn't say it's pops. amazing yeah. or p famous or right. popular. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it's fine. You yeah. see, you're fine. It's it's yeah. a decent film, but it's not going to resonate necessarily with you in the yeah. long run. And then, you know, after all of that, he goes, writes, directs, stars, triple threats, and then he turns right around, and he's in a movie that I will never forgive. And that is Armageddon. Mm -hmm. Michael Bay's uh, asteroid disaster film starring Ben Affleck and Bruce Willis. And was it, uh, don't want to miss a thing. Uh, Aerosmith. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, it's obviously completely nuts in terms of, like, the physics and the the laws <laughs> oh, of yeah. science oh, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, I, don't, I honestly don't mind it. Like, between this and, was it um, Deep Impact, mm -hmm. I would still argue this was the better film. I will say, giving the I will give this movie one one nugget of credibility. It's the only one it's ever going to get. It's the only thing I could find that I actually thought that's actually kind of cool, which is this is the first movie that the cast was allowed to use genuine NASA spacesuits. The that's cast cool. are the only civilians to ever wear NASA spacesuits. Even and, still? Uh, I, yeah, I believe so. Wow. And each of those NASA spacesuits cost $3 million. Each one. So that's kind of neat. Like, I, wow, they it, must have spent like Thirty million dollars on NASA spacesuits. Yeah. I mean, uh, but I mean that's kind of neat that they at least went that. On the flip side, um, you know, the cuts in the film are an average of one and a half seconds. Wow. Yeah, it's like watching a music video, which is not that good. Uh, according to the Criterion commentary, which I find entertaining that yes, this movie criterion. has a Criterion release, uh, and this is this. This just solidifies my hatred for this movie. It might make some people really love it more, but this is for me. Many of the errors found in the film were acknowledged by the director and known even during filming and production, and were left in deliberately, such as fire and space. Michael Bay said, quote, It's a movie, and not many people know about it. So they were kept in for entertainment value. I, I mean, I, I, I definitely appreciate, like, the quote is kind of dumb, but there's an element of that I agree with that like I think it's a it, fine line. You can you can do that, but mm. I, I think I think it's where that he said like most people don't know it, so yeah. it's fine. Like if you just said it's a movie, I would have been like, okay, that's totally fine. Like I don't I mean, I feel like there has to be a, a, an element of like you just let people yeah, well, be yeah. creative and do what they yeah. need to do. Yeah, but when you're like saying like, Oh, people don't care about science. That's, come on, dude. 
I don't know. Oh. I, I think if you ask, like, It's a 100... movie that has a premise that's a science fiction sure, premise. Sure, sure. Come okay, on. <laughs> sure. I'll, 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 I'll give you that. But if we actually went outside and questioned a hundred people about mm -hmm. fire in space, what percentage do you think would know that you can't have fire in space? Most of them. Mm. I, I feel like I feel like this is the same thing I, I frequently get in like and then the elections come and I'm like America is so much dumber than I can I mean I guess it <laughs> depends on which hundred people you ask but oh <laughs> uh, I mean it, I don't mind it. I, I, I mean I think it, it's 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 so absurd that we're flying people and landing on an asteroid like and this is another thing that I love that I just love about this movie this is one of those ones that I'm a Ben Affleck defender still to this day not all of his films, but for the majority of them. And this is one of those movies that he gets a lot of crap for. Whether the people like the movie or not, sure. he's totally like generic boy hero and mm -hmm. people were really upset or didn't like him in various reasons. But I find it interesting that even as far back as this, because you know, he had a career going by this point, but not anywhere near sure. where he's at now. Regarding the film's premise, Ben Affleck actually asked the director, he said, Michael Bay, he said, wouldn't it be easier for NASA to just train astronauts to drill rather than train drillers to be astronauts? Michael Bay just told Affleck to shut up. That was his response. I mean, Literally, it goes more of that. I, people won't know. Just shut up. Just, just stupid. People don't care about things. It's <laughs> more explosions uh, equals profit. Uh, well, that is true. In terms of Steve Buscemi, like, he's part of the group of uh, drillers yes, that go up yes, there. And he yes. is funny because he loses his mind yes, during the process. Yes, like, he's definitely... Space dementia. Yeah, he, he really... Well, there it is right there. Oh, my God. Yeah. He, I mean, he's... I mean, each of them sort of have their own problems. Yes. Like, you know, uh, he has space dementia. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Bruce Willis is the one who has to sort of keep everything together. Mm -hmm. You know, Ben, ben Affleck has the love story. Yeah, and, I mean, he, each have their sort of, like part to play and his mm -hmm. is sort of the over the top uh womanizing mm -hmm. uh money throwing um driller and mm -hmm. it's sort of interesting to sort of see him lose his shit when they <laughs> finally were up in space so i don't know but hey you I know i mean fun. at least steve buscemi got some money out of it i guess right That's the I, i'll defend it still but you know what else <sighs> Whatevs. But it's okay. In the same way, I'm an Affleck apologist. You're a Michael Bay apologist. So, I'm a, you know. I, I, I will defend both of them. I, I've, I've long said that Affleck is the best part of Good Will Hunting. A lot of and people he was the just, bomb in Phantoms, yo. Yeah. <laughs> Moving right along, though, we're going to jump forward to one that I think we both can agree on. I think most people can agree on. Pixar's Monsters, Inc. Yes. In this one, Steve Buscemi plays, what's his name? Um, Sa Sir Randall Sa Boggs. Uh, Bo yeah, Randall, sorry. Who is the villain of the Monsters, Inc., mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. is going up against Mike and uh, Sully mm -hmm. in an attempt to, you know, take over the control the of... The scare... Company or yes. whatever you want to call it. Exactly. I forget what it was their, called. Their whole they they make energy through scaring mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. is how they make power, and that's their old job. Most uh, uh, at the time it was released, the most uh, successful animated film to date. But when it came out, not surprising. It was pretty amazingly popular and amazingly good. Oh, the, film. the amount of detail they went to make like the the hair and fur. Yeah, I was actually going to really bring that up. It new took technology. Being you know considering Spencer and I on some relatively recent occasion I'll do editing of video I think yeah. you can appreciate this specific factoid it took normally 11 to 12 hours to render a single frame of Sully because of his 2.3 million individually animated hair strands 2.3 million hair strands they had to create new technology yeah. just to make this movie yeah because hair is like w one of the hardest things to animate in film so it's because there's 2.1 million hair strands there you <laughs> yeah go. but i mean 12 hours for a frame which means you're on average spending about eight days to film to render just render a second of footage yeah that's fucking nuts <laughs> i would just you Respect. must do a lot of reading. Those animators must get a lot of other stuff done in that time, or multitask a lot. I'm sure they have other computers that they switch I know, between. Yeah, probably. Like, boop, boop, boop. They're like, render, 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 render. By the time they get back around, the first one's done. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it's it's a fun story. I, mm -hmm. mean, I think the relationship between Mike and Sully is really oh, quite yeah. sweet. And then Boo, the oh, little girl Mary that Gibbs. actually gets sucked back into mm -hmm. the world of Monsters, Inc. Mary Gibbs was so young at the time they filmed it that they had problems getting her to hang out in a studio and record lines. Like, she was so young, so instead they just followed her around with a microphone and cut her line together from things she said while playing. So they just let her play with stuff, and they just cut all the lines together. Pretty cool. That's cool. I mean, it's a great film. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about them making a sequel. I mean... Prequel? 
Yes, it is a technically a prequel. Come it's on. their college years. Mm -hmm. uh, Monster U. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in terms of this, I mean, I think this is one of the more underrated Pixar movies. I think a lot of really? people have forgotten about it. Oh, yeah. With, the, like, the recent run of stuff, I think a lot of people have well, forgotten. it's been it. back in theaters for 3D and all the stuff for this sequel. Maybe people are re-remembering how Maybe, great it was. But, I mean, at the, at the time, obviously, it was big. But I think ever since, like, you know, probably around Finding Nemo, Finding Nemo and beyond, yeah, like, people true. have largely forgotten about it. I the, mean, just the continuous blockbuster role of Pixar makes you sometimes yeah. forget other things they've done. And, I mean, it, it, it was great. I mean, it's in it's, the same way that we sometimes forget Christopher Nolan did Memento because of how incredible Inception and the Batman films were. Or the Prestige. I mean, yeah, there's any number. True. Like, it's just, it's just unfortunate. I mean, they've done so many releases that are at such a high level mm -hmm. that even their like earlier ones that may or may not be at quite that high level mm -hmm. are forgotten. Like, it's like it didn't exist. The, it's like, oh yeah, they did that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is like, I think, the John Goodman convinced Steve Buscemi to take the role of Randall, which kind of makes sense because this is, I think, the fourth film that they've acted together in, sure. and the first one that hasn't been produced or directed by Coen Brothers. They had a lot of Coen Brother matchups yeah. before. Yeah. But. I mean, it's 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 definitely a cute film, and, and I mean, Steve Buscemi's character is definitely uh, a slimy sort oh, of yeah. lizard guy. He's really weaselly. Yeah. But he's not a weasel. He's no, he's a, a lizard, lizard chameleon. Yeah. I forget. Chameleon. Yeah. 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 It's, it's monster cool. that can go invisible. I mean, he doesn't have to be a real creature. He's sure. a monster. Sure. One that you're a huge oh, fan yeah. of, though, and one that finally is really letting Steve Buscemi showcase himself yes. as a leading man is Boardwalk Empire, yes. the HBO TV show about Atlantic City during Prohibition. Mm -hmm. First episode starts on the night before Prohibition goes into effect. Yes. So, really, period piece. Um, this Not only is this movie or show, uh, which is great on HBO, uh, really gives... Steve Buscemi a chance to highlight his role. I mean, he's the main character. He's the visual element of the show that they showcase. Everything is about him. The plots revolve around him. The interesting thing for me is that, because uh, it's all based on real-life people that existed mm -hmm. around the sure. time, the real-life figure of Nucky Thompson uh, was inspired by Nucky Johnson that actually existed, Enoch Johnson. Um, the original Enoch Johnson was a physically commanding man, both tall and heavy set, with a receding hairline. He was quite what? unlike Steve Buscemi. You're saying they're not the same? No, but it, well, but interestingly enough, this is what I, I, even more than the fact that what a surprise he didn't look like Steve Buscemi. Who does? No one. Um, is the fact that he basically looked like Tony Soprano, the actual guy from The Sopranos. But Terrence Winter, the creator of Boardwalk Empire, wrote for Soprano. The Sopranos a lot. So when he wrote the character of Nucky Thompson with specifically with Steve Buscemi in mind, partially to make a central figure so different from Tony Soprano in that similar world. And he also worked with them on The Sopranos. Yeah. But so, I mean, they definitely have familiarity, and I'm sure exactly. you know, Martin Scorsese and being mm -hmm. involved definitely helps Steve Still Buscemi. an executive producer to this day. But I think it's interesting to have that element of be like, you know what, I want to make another gangster-style story. This character is another Tony Soprano. Let's get this other individual and have the same story, but have such a different main character character and it's true it totally works there's something about the fact of Steve Buscemi as the central figure of power that I think is so much it showcases the fact that it's all about his mind because he's not a good-looking man sure and he's not a huge scary man so clearly in that time he got by by on, on those wits I mean I, I've just gotten I mean into the show so I'm not nearly as far along mm. as you and I really enjoy Steve Buscemi in it but I gotta say my favorite part of the show is Al Capone Oh, I yeah. really like mm -hmm. the guy. Was it um, Stephen Graham oh, plays yeah. Al Capone? Like I had no Braden idea that. Snatch. I, yeah, I had no idea Al, Al Capone was mm -hmm. even going to be in the series. Yep. And he's just he's the young Al Capone. Yep. He's really sort of the up and comer, mm -hmm. and his his sort of personality really is just so entertaining. Yes. It's almost like I, I'm like I want I want more of that show. Like <laughs> that's the show I want. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Like the, the it's it's so much more sort of lively, actiony, mm -hmm. funny. Mike K. Williams is just great too. It's yeah. Chalky White. Right. I mean, which, and they're not going to complain about Omar being. Yeah. Any, exactly. anything like this show really is like one of those shows that did a good job at, at filling out like HBO is good at doing filling out a very strong supporting sure. cast very strong and I, I mean my only problem is not I mean I like I like I like Steve Buscemi. I think Nucky mm -hmm. Thompson is interesting. I just think the supporting characters might be a little bit more interesting no, it's, than Nucky Thompson. It, it, it harkens back to me in a way of an argument I constantly have, which isn't really an argument. It's more just a point that people could agree with about Battles, the Battlestar Galactica reboot where mm -hmm. Gaius Baltar is the main character of that series, but that doesn't mean he has the most screen time. It doesn't mean every, the most sure. stuff happens with him. Steve Buscemi's in it a lot. He has a lot of screen time, but realistically speaking... 
it's not just his decisions, but it's the world around him and the way all these supporting actors and characters are influencing each other and working together and his dealings with them. Yeah. So I think it's interesting that he's the main character and everything's about him, but really, it's all, he's almost a supporting character at times in the show. But I, it's, it's fascinating. I go the other way, and I think this just really speaks to, you know, part of why he's been so successful in his career is that perhaps supporting characters can be some of the most interesting characters in things That's because, a good point. you know, they really can go a little bit more wild with those characters yep. and the leads. I mean, a lot of the time, I think it freaks people out. Mm -hmm. If the leads are too crazy, it's yeah. kind of challenging to watch. So, and, and even though it's a fictional story based on actual events, a lot of the characters did exist and did talk to each other at the time, like Lucky Luciano and um, Al Capone and... Um, uh, Al Capone's boss, so I can't remember, Johnny Torrio? Yeah, these were all actual gangsters and people that actually encountered each other, dealt with each other. Um, Michael Rothstein, the, the actor who plays him, I forget his name right now, okay. but uh, Michael Rothstein did, the guy who plays him, did so much research into the actual character that he plays. Um, uh, there's so many people I'm looking I know. for. Anyway. But, uh, we'll uh, Either way, he did so much research that the show's cre uh, writers and researchers started just that he knew more than they did. So they started just being like, "Oh, all right, you 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 give us the ideas of what that guy actually did in real life." Oh, is he really that far? Uh, yeah. there, there's way. a whole bunch of people, but I mean, it's I mean, very accurate show. Uh, they recreated the 1920s. Michael Schulberg. Yes, thank you. Uh, Schulberg. They recreated. The 1920s Atlantic City in a set in Brooklyn, New York with such accuracy that um, Martin Scorsese was so specific about it that he even had like the wood planks they used on the boardwalk were the exact same size and dimensions as those in the actual boardwalk. Wow. And this is totally one of those shows, you ever want to be blown away by what green screen technology has done for television? Just watch a behind the scenes, like the visual effects of any of the seasons of this show. It's crazy. It's like one or two buildings, and then they recreate the entire actual Atlantic City skyline behind it. It's so well yeah, done, so I mean, accurate. It's, it's it's accurate, but some of it does not feel necessarily like the most impressive stuff. Like some of like the boardwalk stuff when they have them walking on the boardwalk at times, it feels a little CGI heavy to me. But Maybe I very much enjoy the show. <laughs> I really like that. Yeah, and it's still running. So I think it just finished its third season. Yeah, awesome. kicking butt, taking names. <laughs> Moving right along, though, this Friday, March mm -hmm. 15th, we have The Incredible Wonderstone, mm -hmm. which is a magician rivalry movie starring Steve Carell and Jim Carrey. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, Steve Carell and Steve Buscemi are like classic kind partners. Of, yeah, partners, kind of more classic, like Siegfried and Roy style Penn magicians. And Teller. Yeah, Penn and Teller. And then you have the Chris Angel, Jim Carrey yeah. character, David Blaine, extreme magician. And there's like a magician competition. Yeah, yeah. St uh, James Gandolfini has a casino that's right. giving like $5 million uh, That's where magicians show make their to, money. Yeah, $5 million show to whoever wins the competition. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of like this back and forth. And Steve Buscemi's character sort of reminds me of his role in like The Wedding Singer, uh -huh. where he's yeah. sort of like this side comic mm -hmm. relief kind yeah. of guy. I mean, I, I, think, I think it does not look great, but... I it, think, again, it's one of those movies that that rides that cusp where I think it has... A, it, it Like, in the same way that when I originally saw the trailers for, like, Zoolander and Anchorman, I thought they looked fucking retarded. There's a chance that it might be funny. I don't think it will probably go into that area, but there's a chance that this movie could be really, really sure. funny. Because, I mean, Dueling Magicians, I don't really think that's been... I think Jim Carrey Dumb. does look funny in his surf sort of <laughs> engine. Like, and, he, and Jim Carrey's good when he can be over the top. And, and this is definitely an over the top role for him. I think Steve Buscemi looks funny in his sort of supporting <laughs> role. Blonde wig. The problem for me is Steve Carell. Like, really? a, I don't hmm. know if I'm a hundred percent on sold on Steve Carell all the time. He's done a few things I've enjoyed, but He's I think also there's done a few not so great things. Exactly. And Date yet, night. <laughs> yeah. Like, and yet, like, I don't know. Like, he. If he's great, if he's on, he's great. It's but true. if he's yeah. off, it's just like yeah. it's painful to watch. Yeah. And this like one, the later seasons, of The Office. Yeah, it just like I was never even that huge of a fan of The Office. Let's, to be honest, let's just let me get that out there to begin with. Okay, um, it was okay, but like. Yeah, like, I haven't seen that spark in him so far in the trailers and stuff that make me feel like, okay, this is Steve Carell being yes. on. It looks like Steve Carell 
trying too hard to be on. I can understand thus far. that, and that's why and I'm considering like, he's the titular character. Yes. It's kind of that's a problem. Yeah, yeah. like it, that could sink or swim it in a lot of ways, yeah. even if the supporting people are good. So that's my concern. If it's great, awesome. Like more yeah. power to him. I don't have that much faith in it. I would like to. I would like to be pleasantly surprised. Whenever I see a comedy coming out with a lot of good stars that looks like it's going to be stupid, I kick myself about judging it too fast sure. because for every uh, Ricky Bobby shit fest there's also like Step Brothers or Anchorman or Zoolander that come out that or Tropic Thunder even I thought that was gonna be yeah. that looked like it could be, could have gone that realm too and it sure. didn't so yeah we'll see maybe it just depends on who's behind the scenes fingers crossed I don't know yeah I mean well, you know, let me bring that up actually <laughs> see who's the writer yeah, director I mean, of it we got uh, Dan Scardino who who directed uh, two uh, broke girls, Royal Project, a lot Rock. of TV, a lot yeah. of TV. I mean, not the most inspiring cast list for a major feature film. No. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's not looking too good. Yeah. So that that's that's a little oh. bit of a uh, of problem. Yeah. I mean, I it's I don't know. It, it's it's a t it's a tough sell because it's such a weirdly specific topic. Yes, like it feels like you really have to be on to do yes, a film about true. magicians. Otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of niche jokes that just fail, just yeah. flop. I mean, it's I, I mean I don't know. I, I think uh, still trying to find something to make me believe that this guy is like <laughs> okay worthwhile. To, I mean, you're not gonna find it, Spencer. Stop looking. Tracy takes on is that some Ed? <laughs> Hope and faith, law and order, <laughs> rescue me. <laughs> okay, we're just not looking good for you. No. Sorry. No. Anyway, let us know what you think of uh, Steve Buscemi mm -hmm. and perhaps Burt Wonderstone, mm -hmm. and uh, join us next week for our DVD rundown for the week of March nineteenth. Mm -hmm. Oof. And as always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast, phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes, we're on Blip.tv, we're on Roku, we're on Miro. Checking to get glue, you can leave us reviews on iTunes, you can comment on the YouTubes. And uh, we'll catch we're you later. We're all over there. We're all over. See ya. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to buy the same style. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.